Okie dokie. Well, I want to make sure that we give our guests this evening as much time as possible um, to speak. So I'm going to start us off, uh, if folks don't mind. And I'm going to be letting people in as I talk. So like I said, I apologize for multitasking. Um, but to get us started, um, I just want to introduce myself. So my name is Kira Mann, and I am the Assistant Coordinator of Programs and Events uh, here at Canadian Friends Service Committee. And I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, I just want to let folks know that we are recording this evening, um, and that is for the Quaker Archives and also for any friends who are not able to join us tonight. So if you don't want to be recorded, please turn off your video. Um, and you can do that using the button in the bottom left corner of your screen. Um, CFSC is located on the traditional territory of the Wendat Petun Nation and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This land has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years and is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, a sacred treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek. Um, but I recognize that folks on this call are from all across Turtle Island. Um, and I invite you to put which territory you're on in the name um, and your Zoom name uh, if you would like uh, so that we know where you're joining us from. Um, I wanna start this evening off with a few minutes of silent worship, about five of them. Um, so if you are new um, if we just are going to share some silence um, and I'm going to be putting some messages in the chat box for folks that join us throughout so they know what we're doing so um, I'm sorry for that interruption but um, please please settle in with us.
Thank you, friends. Um, before we get started this evening, I just want to go over um, a couple of housekeeping items, as I usually do. Um, I'm just asking that folks keep themselves uh, muted throughout the, oops, sorry, off this phone, um, keep themselves muted throughout this evening. Um, and also, um, if we can, the chat is open, I'm just asking that we keep it a safe and respectful place as with the discussion following Roger and Tony's presentations. Um, if you're having issues with connectivity, um, I just suggest try turning off your video. Um, that usually helps with the speed and connection a little bit. And if that doesn't work, I just suggest leaving the meeting altogether and then coming back in and I'll, I'll reconnect you. And that very often does the trick. Um, I, I mentioned this before, but I just want to mention it for the folks that have joined us since. Um, this evening is being recorded uh, for the Quaker Archives and for the folks that were not able to join us tonight. Uh, so if you do not want to be on the recording, please turn off your video. Um, and also, we will be having a discussion at the end, like I said, so I really invite you to save your questions until the end. Um, and then please feel free to unmute yourself to ask your question. Um, or if you're having a hard time sort of fitting in there, um, use your raise the hand button and I'll call on you. Um, but that being said, um, I just wanted to say a few things before our speakers start. So um, CFSE is the Peace and Social Justice Agency of Canadian Quakers. And we've been hosting these Get to Know the Friends events um, on the last Thursday of every month of 2021. Um, so far, we've heard really amazing stories about how friends came to Quakers, how they came to service work, and so much more. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Roger and Tony's stories this evening. Um, Roger and Tony are actually our final speakers in the Get to Know the Friends series, as next month's event is going to look a little bit different, and I'll say more about that at the end. Um, but I'm very happy to have these two as our final speakers. Um, we asked Roger and Tony to be involved tonight um, as they're both war resistors and they're also oh, very generous supporters of CFSC. Uh, and I can't stress enough how much we appreciate our donors and how absolutely crucial they are to the work that we do and the work that you've been hearing about for the last 10 months. Um, because we have two speakers and I wanna give them as much time as possible, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, so why don't I just get us started? Um, and Roger, do you wanna take us off? I do, thank you, Kara. Uh, I'm Roger Davies. I live in Halifax and I'm with Halifax uh, Friends Meeting. And I just wanna thank so much uh, CFSC for all their work and also the invitation to work with Tony and Kira on this lovely project. I acknowledge that I live in Mi'kma'ki, where the Mi'kmaq people have lived for thousands of years before the settler occupiers came here, which is in a sense, my heritage. The settler occupier leader, Cornwallis, established policy to carry out genocidal extermination of the people who first lived here. There was a statue of Cornwallis in the park in front of the train station here in Halifax, but it's now been removed. The Cornwallis Street Baptist Church congregation changed the name of their church to New Horizons Baptist Church. And Cornwallis Junior High had its name changed by the city. There is some progress being made, bringing the truth of this place to light. So Kira, if you could put up the first slide for me, please. So uh, friends, when I was invited uh, to participate, um, the first query that came to me about this was, what canst thou say in 20 minutes? <laughs> So I started to do a bit of, of thinking and various things popped into my mind. You can hopefully see them in kind of a circle around there. So I'm gonna mention a few just quickly now and then proceed through the slides with a little more detail about some of these topics of, of my experience that I'm bringing. So you see up there teaching, 
when I, when I first arrived in Canada, I went to teacher's college in Toronto. And uh, there I met my Canadian wife, Judith McQuaid. And uh, we then set out for Newfoundland to a little outport where we stayed four years. Our daughter Gwen was born there and uh, taught school. And then we decided, well, time to get to a bigger city. So we moved back to Halifax. And uh, I've been inc incredibly lucky in uh, finding wonderful venues for teaching opportunities. I taught in a alternative school for youth in desperate circumstances. And after that lost its funding, I taught in a prison uh, for about 12 years. And following that, I got a job uh, coordinating literacy and upgrading programs uh, using volunteers in some of our Halifax libraries. And then finally, I actually taught uh, ecology and religion at St. Mary's, uh, filling in in the religion department when a friend of mine went on sabbatical. So my teaching, I think, has been, it's, I've been really fortunate in going to work every day to teach and enthusiastic uh, about what I hoped I could accomplish. Um, okay, another little thing that I can mention on that list there would be our refugee sponsorship. Um, Halifax Monthly Meeting is pretty small, but twice we took on sponsorships. Uh, if any of you have been, been involved, you know what a big piece of work that is. The fundraising, the paperwork, the setting up households, the whole bit. So quite a bit involved with that. Our first sponsorship was um, a group of people from Ethiopia. And we actually partnered with the Ethiopian Association here, which made it just so much better doing that. And then a few years later, we sponsored a family uh, that was reuniting with parents, uh, Iraqi family who had originally come from Palestine. So myself and my now partner, Helen Lofgren, hi, Helen. Uh, I, I just wanna say my wife, Judy died uh, in 2011. And so I'm very unfortunate to have my friend, friend, small f, big f, Helen, as my partner. Um, anyway, so that's, that's just a couple of, of things that uh, I wanted to mention there that I could get into a little more detail. Okay, uh, Carol, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, okay, this phrase popped into my mind when I started thinking about this emerging manifestations of, love poss of love's possibilities. And um, each of us would have a maybe slightly different little themes around the circle here. Um, but there's one that I want to touch upon. It's the very first one at the top there, attentive care and compassion. And if you remember anything about what I say tonight, I think I might like you to try to remember this one. There were two Quakers in my life, one when I was 13 years old, another when I was 20. The first person, the Quaker, Doug Kinsey, was a camp counselor of mine at a, a camp in Northern Minnesota. The other person, Russell Compton was my philosophy professor at university, both Quakers. And here's what happened. They uh, had time for me. They paid attention to me. They saw something within me that I don't think anyone else was acknowledging. In other words, they, they brought a spirit within me to life. And uh, I, I really can't imagine it happening in any other way. And with neither one of these wonderful people did we ever talk about Quakerism much at all. But they, these two men were the genuine item, the Quakers in the deepest, profoundest sense. And this, I think, has 
been so important in my life, the way things eventually went in terms of uh, refusing to be drafted and some of the work I've done in Canada. So uh, to me, it's just a huge thing. Okay, next slide, Kara, please. Um, so what I ended up doing kind of, oh, all these different things are related to each other. The people, worship, imagination, creativity, concerns, leadings, testimonies, way will open. It's like this kind of living dynamic that we're all within. And um, for each one of us, things would get weighted in different ways. But I guess because I'm a teacher, I'm showing you this, right? Because it might be of some value to you. So you're learning something about me. I, I like questions and I, I like queries. Okay, let's uh, keep going. Okay, war is stupid. Muriel Duckworth said that. This um, image here is from the book some of you may know about or have. Uh, yes to Canada, when grandpa refused to fight in the Vietnam War, a, a book for young people that I did with my artist friend, uh, In A. Kim. And uh, I just wanted to say something about, about Muriel. Uh, you know, I'm so lucky to have, have known her. She had this amazing balance, Muriel Duckworth, between a kind of a deep grounded personhood and at the same time, just endless commitment to the work of, of trying to make positive change. And, and she just had, had both of those things. So what's coming up next here? One time Muriel at uh, worship, her testimony was this, the soul is water or the soul is like water. And I kept thinking about that. And then I had an opportunity to read a peace poem at one of our Hiroshima uh, Remembrance events here in Halifax on the Dartmouth waterfront at the Peace Pavilion. So I wrote a poem, which I read. And uh, if you have the next slide, uh, Kara, I've printed that out. August 6th, Peace Prayer. Muriel Duckworth, Peace Woman, says the soul is water. Let us then be thirsty for peace. Let us want peace the way our thirsting bodies seek water. Let peace flow like a river, a river we will not to divert, nor bottle for sale, nor poison, nor make lifeless. There is a river of peace and delight, each wisdom child, each wisdom elder knows. Let us follow down by the river's side. The sound of peace is the murmuring of the stream. In the river of peace, the gentle souls and the tormented souls and the disembodied souls of war float by, voicing the invocation. The dead have always whispered to the living, enter the waters of life, shun all others. Upstream, there is fresh snow melt. It is the peace-filled desire of the yet unborn, the voices asking for one fulfilled life for each precious soul. We are given the gift of listening. We are given the gift of hearing, the whispers of the peaceful word when we close with no regret, the book of fears and the book of force. There is an earthly place of voices and listeners that does not stop us dead in our tracks, but floats us, cradles us. It is this very earth, this very moment. When life speaks, draw close. There is nothing to write down after all, for it, it is the open hand and the tender voice of peace we seek and offer. Amen. Next uh, slide, please, Kara. Okay, here we are, uh, CFSC. Um, 
down in the lower corner there, you, you can see on the slide the uh, counter recruitment pamphlet that Orion and I and others worked on that's still around. And uh, that was when I was on the board there. And I was on the uh, criminal justice uh, group because, you know, I had experience in a teach, working in a prison. I knew what incarceration did to people. Anyway, we worked on that counter recruitment and um, we, we distributed some of those in Halifax. And I think they were used elsewhere. And it might be fun to revisit that uh, possibly, Kara. What do you think? And, and see if it needs a, a few changes, a couple of tweaks. Um, such wonderful people, you know, employed at CFSC, but on the board, volunteers, you know, there's Matt's amazing work and Jennifer's endless work to get the declaration adopted and acknowledged, just incredible commitment and, uh, and many others uh, as, as well. And um, boy, it's just good to know amongst the small numbers of Quakers in Canada, we got, we got this going for us. So I totally support it. Now, I'm gonna say right now, uh, this book, Yes to Canada, uh, what I'm gonna do, if anybody wants a copy, I'm happy to send you uh, copies. Uh, and I would ask you as you're led to make a contribution to CFSC. So if you wanna put in the chat, maybe Kira, just yes to Canada.ca, which is the website for that book. And you can contact me through the website. There's a, there's a way to do that. So um, have a look at it and see what you think. Okay, how am I doing for time, Kira? I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay, let's keep going. Next slide. Okay, so this is also from, from that book. Um, when I was uh, in 1968, uh, in the spring, I would passed the physical and I was drafted and I had to make up my mind what I was gonna do. And I, I knew that I had somehow found out that there was draft counseling in Bloomington, Indiana, Quakers. And I, I went there and um, it was just incredibly helpful to me. I, I've written to that meeting and thanked them for what they did for me. Because what happened during those times, and some of you may know this, Americans against the draft and Canadians helping us were very much in touch, you know? Uh, so they had such good information about what, how I needed to prepare at the border. You could get into Canada with landed immigrant status at that time, right at the border. So I, I knew what I needed and um, I knew where to go in Toronto, uh, the Union of American Exiles, which later on um, we, we did the same thing. When people arrived, they needed a place to stay right away. <clears throat> so we provide you know, temporary housing. So um, yeah, that uh, Quakers really stepped up on both sides of the, the border in terms of war resistance. So if we could look at the next slide, um, also from the book, uh, Canadian Friends Service Committee, Halifax uh, meeting. I, I know Dick Cotterell's with us. Uh, he, he experienced coming to Canada and, and arriving in Halifax and got uh, help right away. Um, by the way, uh, We'll show you on the last screen. If you want to read a bit about my story and, and Dick's and Margo Overington's, uh, it's at the Pier 21 website, and we'll show you the link for that. Um, CFSC was amazing. I don't know the total details of this, but they sent, um, I, I believe it was medical supplies to both North and South Vietnam which of course the US government, found, this was illegal according to US government policy, but that wasn't gonna stop what needed to happen. Okay, we'll keep moving along here. Okay, so um, I'm gonna tell you now about something else that really caught my interest. Um, 
I was out in BC and uh, was taking in the uh, wonderful, wonderful folk festival they had there, they do have there. And I came across a book called The Universe Story by a guy named Thomas Berry and Brian, and Brian Swim. And I was blown away by this book because it combined science, spirituality, psychology. I mean, it was just holy smoke. I, I had to find out who this Barry person is and find out more about him. So I did, and I, then I ended up going to, to workshops in different parts of the country and um, made, I developed some workshops myself, which I gave twice, uh, 10, 10 session things at the Unitarian Church. And uh, I, I was kind of moved to try to do some artwork uh, based on this kind of vision of some of what I'd felt. So you can see two, two images there. These actually turned out were large, like two by three foot transparencies that were in the windows of the UU church. Um, and I made many more like that. I also got interested in uh, the work of Johanna Macy, the, the work that reconnects and, and started uh, offering workshops based on her workshop development. So that, that was an important part of my, my life there as well. Okay, let's keep going to the next one. Okay, there's another, another image that I made. I actually gave this to Tom Barry once that he appreciated that a kind of tree of life, Mandela. Okay, next, next one. Swim and Barry don't talk about the Big Bang. They talk about the original flaring forth. Okay, here we have, um, I'm starting to run out of time maybe. Um, okay. Uh, almost finished. Um, after the, in 1989, 14 women were murdered in Montreal. You know about this. Uh, a group of us said, okay, men, we got to get together and work on violence and relationships. So we started a group called Men for Change. We had kind of support group amongst ourselves and uh, talking with one another in ways that most men don't. And we wrote, wrote a curriculum, myself, Peter Davison, Andrew Safer, and we um, sold over 5,000 of, of the, the book. And if anybody wants copies of the PDF, I can get them to you. Okay, let's, let's go to the last slide, I guess. Okay, yeah. So um, that's one way to reach me. Uh, through my that email address, or just go to yes to Canada.ca and go to the go to the Pier 21 website. And uh, if you put in my name or Dick's or Marcos, you'll you'll find what we wrote there. It was kind of a good thing to do. Um, okay, uh, there. That's my 20 minutes. Thank you, friends. Thanks very much, Roger. Um, and I'm happy to put, um, I, I couldn't while I was sharing, but I'm happy to put those links that you were talking about in the chat so uh, folks can reach them a little bit easier. And we also have a couple of copies of your book here in the office if folks in Toronto are interested. Um, we're happy to, to share those and thank you so much for, um, for that. Um, okay, so uh, Tony, why don't I pass it over to you? Well, friends, we've been sitting for a while. Those who can, let me suggest you get up and just stretch and wiggle a little before you uh, carry on. Uh, I know the importance of that or you know, take a washroom break if you've got earphones or whatever, but uh, I'm hoping you're not going to go to sleep on me. So I thought maybe we should wiggle a little bit before we uh, get started. So in, I thought instead of doing a land acknowledgement, I talk about CFSC's Reconciliation Fund and the time I would do that. And I see that Jim and Janet Papel are, are with us tonight. 
Um, Fran and I and Jim and Janet were driving to FGC and we're, we were reading Rupert Ross's book, Dancing with a Ghost, which shared a bunch of his experience um, with indigenous peoples in Northern Ontario and some of the remarkable wisdom and insights that he gained from that. And at that FGC uh, meeting, uh, week long meeting, there was a lot of concern because there'd been another uh, black man shot when his car was stopped for the out, taillight being out or something by the police. And so the whole issue of reconciliation was bubbling for me. But for me as a Canadian, it felt much more like it was an issue of how uh, we needed to work on reconciliation with the uh, indigenous communities across Canada and, and what a terrible job our government was doing on our behalf at that time. And so I reached out to CFSC saying, is there something we could be doing? And out of that grew the Reconciliation Fund. So now I celebrate Canada Day by garnishing my uh, taxable income for the previous year and making a donation specifically to that fund every year. I don't know if it's the right percentage to do, but at least I know that something, I'm making a direct contribution uh, to something that is going to be working for reconciliation. And I'll say it at the end, I think, but I, I wanna say it now. One of the great things to me about CFSC is it lets me have a sense of, of hope because I've got limited resources. And if you listen to the daily news, the world has so many places that need something being done, need rights being, uh, or wrongs being righted, uh, need people getting care. Um, and it can just be overwhelming. But I know that by the donations I give to CFSC and other charities, I'm helping in some ways to address these issues. And they connect, I think, very directly to my reason for um, being a war resistor and uh, my story. So I'll, I'll go there and I have pasted into the chat uh, some various links on uh, various um, things about our farm and that if you want more detail on that. Um, but I grew up in a, a Quaker, uh, not a community, it was a, a community outside Philadelphia, um, but went to Quaker meeting, went to a Quaker nursery school, um, went to the public school system after that, except my last three years of high school, I went to a Quaker boarding school. So I had a lot of contact with Quakers um, and experience in Quaker uh, meeting. But when I was 16, um, our, our meeting did several things. Uh, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, the Downingtown Area Interracial Coalition was formed. And it was realized that black kids in our community had no place to go on Friday or Saturday night. And yeah, they got in trouble because they were hanging out at the street corner rather than at the dance or whatever. And so we used our little um, Quaker schoolhouse, the schoolhouse that was associated with our meeting house to start an interracial coffee house, which I helped staff and, and open on Friday and Saturday evening. So that was one kind of formative experience. But the other was when I turned 16 um, and was able to drive myself to meeting uh, the meeting house uh, in the, on Sunday afternoons, I started doing draft counseling um, for other young people in our community. And it was an interesting thing because Emily, oh, um, I'm gonna have a mental breakdown here and not remember the last name. Anyway, um, this was a, wo a woman my parents' age who was from the fighting Quaker tradition and her husband, um, Bob Ma McElveen, Emily and Bob McElveen had been in the, uh, he'd been in the second world war. And uh, so she was there to provide information if people were interested in learning more about military service. But I was there as a 16 year old trying to provide information on uh, the central committee for conscientious objectors and other things. And that process changed my thinking I had initially been figuring I'd be a conscientious objector and apply for that when uh, it became time for me to turn 18 and register for the draft. But in that process, I came to realize how coercive the selective service system was, how corrupt it was, and how it was pushing many young people who were just as opposed to the war as I was, but didn't have the religious credentials to seek conscientious objector status. It was pushing them into the reserve officer training. It was pushing them to enlist 
because the front lines were made up of about 90% draftees. So during the two years between my being 16 and 18, I struggled with, well, what do I do? And my initial decision, and, and this led to some very um, intense meetings for worship and very uh, uh, powerful, but not necessarily very clear uh, meeting experiences during that time. But when I turned 18, I refused to register. I sent a letter to the US Attorney General explaining why I wasn't going to register for the draft. And then um, a few years or a few weeks after I got out of high school and had started my summer job, there was an FBI agent there to interview me at home when I got home from work and uh, could have arrested me right then. Refusing to cooperate carried a two to five year prison sentence and a five to $10,000 fine. But he said he wasn't going to arrest me then. He hoped I'd change my mind. We talked about, you know, where you owed allegiance, your country or the higher power. And he left. But through that summer, I continued to struggle. Is this the right decision? And there were a couple of things that then ended up leading me to Canada. Uh, the first was the realization that after I got out of prison as a draft war resistor, I was going to have to be a tax resistor because the tax system was what made the, the technological warfare system and the whole, whole thing possible. And that certainly started to make me think, am I really, am I really in tune with this uh, country? Uh, and the second thing that came along was my mother had found a, a book which documented the uh, prison uh, administration uh, putting war resistors in places where they could be physically and sexually abused by other inmates. And this started to make it look a lot less like a Gandhian experience and a lot more like just um, a pretty uh, destructive thing. And I think the third thing that came for me is it was a pretty depressing time. I thought we might all be blown away in a nuclear war within a couple of years. And I thought, well, is the, am I going to feel I've done the most I could with my life holding on to the Walt prison trials, <laughs> looking at mushroom clouds? And so I decided to emigrate to Canada. I registered for the draft, sent my card back immediately. Um, there's somewhere in their files a, a long essay about why I was registering and how I was going to send my card back. And uh, I applied to enter Canada um, long before I was drafted. And one of my happy experiences from that time was driving up to the New York uh, consul, Canadian consul, to put in my application. And I'm filling this thing out. And one of the things is, you know, one of the questions he asked is, well, why do you want to come to Canada? And being an honest little Quaker, I told him, you know, I was opposed to the war in Vietnam thinking, boy, this is dumb. Government officials are not going to smile on somebody who's not willing to just get out there and support their country right or wrong. And after I finished my little spiel, he said, well, not everyone agrees with U.S. foreign policy and check the boxes. OK, pass that question. Uh, you know, I'm going to like it here, like Annie says when she's at the mansion, Little Orphan Annie. I, well, this may be good. And so I flew into Canada before my 19th birthday, um, stayed with a Quaker couple uh, in London, Ontario, Ernie and Ida Stabler. And uh, I, I had been working as a hired hand uh, that fall because I didn't go to university um, because the university I was scheduled to go to said if I got arrested, they would not refund my tuition, nor would they refund my dorm costs. And I thought, well, I'm expecting if I stay in the U.S. and go to university, I'm going to get arrested this fall anyway. So why go? So I worked on a, as a hired hand on a dairy farm um, that fall, the fall of 1970, and then got a job as a hired hand uh, in the Godrich area on the dairy farm in that uh, winter of 1971. And the first night or two there, you know, it was very lonely, felt a long way from home. But as I settled in, um, I, I felt like I was a Canadian after a couple of weeks. Um, uh, the, uh, the sort of hate stares and I, uh, <laughs> I, I think it may be nothing the way the U compared to the way the U.S. is polarized now, but there was certainly a lot of pol polarization at that time. A, a young guy with a beard and long hair walking around the streets of a town would get hate stares from little old lady, but walking around the square in Godrich, uh, people would say, how are you doing? Or how are you as they walk past you? Um, and <clears throat> I think for me, it's not only refusing to participate or be part of war. I think our, our comment of trying to take away the root causes of war 
are a very important one. And that certainly has fueled um, much of the things that I've worked on over my life. Um, and I think the biggest chunk of my life in a sense has been trying to take away our sense of war with the environment, um, particularly in agriculture. Um, it was a hired hand. I went to university, both took some agriculture courses and environmental science stuff and uh, became very interested in organic agriculture or ecological agriculture, what we're now calling regenerative agriculture. But it's basically a, an approach to agriculture that says, how do we learn from nature, mimic nature to produce what we need as people for our sustenance, but in a way that, that preserves or even enriches the ecosystem and the environment on which we all depend. And so that has been a very big part of my life um, since coming to Canada. Uh, Fran and I helped form the Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario 42 years ago, which was at that time, there wasn't the internet and it was very hard for people interested in, in farming ecologically to find any source of information. And we formed this little organization with a, a handful of people initially. And I'm proud to say it's grown to an organization that actually has some staff and has about 500 members and is working with a, a group called uh, Farmers for Climate Solutions to um, help us make a much more rapid transition because um, as, as human beings, we connect to the environment every time we take a breath, every time we take a drink, and every time we take a bite of food. Those are very real direct connections to the ecosystem, to the environment. And they're the way we create ourselves, the way we build our physical bodies. And the one where we can have, I think, the most impact is most of us aren't buying air now. Hopefully most of us are not buying water, but are just drinking water. Um, but when we buy food, that's a chance to either vote for an agriculture that's depleting soil organic matter and sending nutrients off to the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf of St. Lawrence, or an agriculture that's building soil organic matter, which is in fact sequestering carbon by photosynthesis into soil carbon and creating a, a much richer and biologically uh, rich and nutritionally rich uh, food system. And so, you know, I've, I've worked on that both with the Ecological Farmers Association, the National Farmers Union, um, but the other areas, um, and, and in a group called the Collaborative Regional Alliance for Farmer Training, which was an organization of ecological farms that took interns and apprentices trying to help train people in a type of agricultural approach that wasn't really available in the ag universities at the time. So um, that's that's been a very important part, but there are several other threads or, or strains to my, my life experience. And that was as a young farmer and somebody concerned about the environment, uh, the late seventies were a very difficult time because our government was fighting inflation that was caused by energy price increases due to the OPEC oil embargo and then some other uh, projects of, of the oil cartels to, to you know quadruple the price of, of crude oil, that was very inflationary, of course. It was inflationary because not only did it cost the, the initial fuel, but all the things that are part of the um, supply chain that depend on fuel. And yet we fought it with high interest rates, um, which was totally ineffective. Um, and, and it was the New Democratic Party that was calling for a made in Canada interest rate policy that, that reflected the actual risk that lenders faced when they were lending in Canada to fairly secure farms and homeowners and small businesses, and an energy policy that would have seen us making a rapid transition uh, to uh, energy efficiency, conservation and renewable energy. So in 1980, I ran uh, federally for the NDP in Huron Bruce and have had a 42 year um, association with the NDP, um, which for a while was my uh, both my political and to some extent my spiritual home because we didn't have a Quaker meeting locally. We were involved in um, Kitchener area monthly meeting. That was who uh, we were married under the care of in uh, cooperation also with the Downing Town Friends meeting. It was a, a co-clearness uh, program of those two meetings when we got married in our orchard in 75. 
but it was also the NDP that helped us start the Lucknow Worship Group because after the 1980 election, one of the people who'd worked in that election, he was either the 80 or 81, was Brent and Carol Boyer. And uh, after the election was over, we called in to have a visit with these people who we'd met through the uh, political process and they had a copy of the Friends Journal sitting on their uh, coffee table. And we said, oh, what do you know about that? And they said, not very much, but it's very interesting or something like that. And so out of that grew the Lucknow Worship Group. And initially it was basically the Boyers and the McQuails and our kids getting together for silent meeting for worship under the care of Kitchener. And it's now grown into a, a small worship group of between six and 10 uh, families at, at times. Um, so that's you know become a very um, important part of our spiritual home and, and where those lines that uh, Roger had all interconnecting and intersecting, one of, one of those examples of how those lines interconnect um, the other, and so for me, in, in part, the effort to create a more socially just society and a more equitable society, which on the political side is my NDP involvement, is part of that trying to look at, at the root causes of conflict, violence, and war in our society. Um, but Fran also, Fran and I also got involved in Friends General Conferences, a uh, couple enrichment program first by taking uh, one of the couple enrichment weekends and then getting trainers to serve as leadership couples. And um, we also uh, became involved in uh, a farm management program called Holistic Management, which was one of the early triple bottom line programs, uh, which talks about healthy land, healthy people, and healthy profits or healthy income. And it was a, an effort developed by a, a fellow who recognized that thinking about how to mimic nature was important, but you also had to involve people so that they would make change because they saw it adding to their quality of life. And so we've been holistic management certified educators for, I guess, about 15 years now, helping people in the farm community think about how to get those things in balance and, and take them all forward. So those have been important aspects of, of my, my journey and my, my travels. Um, and, uh, I'd like to then come back to, to the issue of um, what I see as the value of linking with CFSC through our donation, because I don't take an active role in CFSC. I may have taken an active role nudging it on the uh, reconciliation fund idea, but I, I'm still, <laughs> we're, we're supposed to be semi-retired, but I'm still very busy helping our younger daughter who's taken over the farm. And uh, so I have limited time and, and limited money. Um, but for me, one of the great values of donating to CFSC and some of the other organizations we donate to is first, it sends me a message. I have enough. And that's one of the really terrible things about our culture at the moment is it's so cancerous. It tells people you can never have enough. You always got to have more. My father was an accountant and he said one of the really strange things dealing with some very rich people, he did uh, Mrs. DuPont's account in Wilmington, Delaware uh, for his firm. And I'm not sure this was Mrs. DuPont's position. He said, you know, rich people never think they can have enough. They always want more. And that's the problem with money is, you know, if you're eating pretty soon, your stomach tells you if you have enough. And if you keep eating, it'll tell you much more violently that you had too much. But with money, we can keep adding zeros. And so it's a terrible way to keep score. But for me, if I can donate to CFSC and some to Greenpeace and some to the NDP and some to Friends of the Earth and uh, some to you know, various other organizations, it's telling me I have enough. And that's a wonderful place of personal security. I've got enough to share. And to me, that's an important thing. But it also gives me a sense of hope because I could despair very easily if all I did was listen to the news and didn't do anything else. But by working with, through my donations, other people sharing and working on this stuff, it gives me a sense of hope. And it also gives me a bit of discipline because if I give away money, it isn't sitting in the bank saying, hey, spend me on some indulgence. You know, that, that thing that you went down the rabbit hole on the uh, internet, um, that looks so interesting and good. If you give your money away, it reduces your ability to be a consumer. 
and consumerism is one of the cancers of our culture. And yet there is a very, I, I think, explicit message that if you've got it, you should spend it. You earned it. You deserve it. Go out and spend it on stuff. This is how you, you know, pat yourself on the back and give yourself a sense of, of meaning and purpose. Well, I give it away and that gives me a sense of meaning and purpose as well. So that's why I think um, donations are, are valuable to me. They, they further reinforce any efforts at simplicity that I have. Um, so um, that, that's a little bit about me and, and how I think and how I, I work on this. But uh, I would say to each of you, in terms of the, the, the big crisis we face, and COVID is not the big crisis we face, the big crisis we face is an economy and a mental picture that sees us uh, destroying the ecosystem on which we depend. And in my political stuff, if you go to the, the political federal writing nomination speech of 2019, you'll see me holding up my, my banner of Hazel Henderson's cake chart, which she said, she was an economist said, who said, I'm tired of pie charts. I want a cake chart. And so she made a cake chart and it was a layer cake. And the bottom layer was the ecosystem and the environment. And the next layer was what she called the love economy, the family and the community and the unpaid and the unwaged stuff that we all do for each other. And the next layer of the cake, and now we're getting into the money stuff that G GDP actually analyzes and counts. But she said, you know, that's, that's the public sector, all the stuff that we do for ourselves collectively through government and, and that. And then on top of that is the private sector. And she said, the important thing to remember is that each layer depends on the ones below it. And of course, we've got our cake turned upside down. If you listen to the news and they give you all the stock market stuff and act as if that's what's really important. So that bottom layer, the ecosystem is in grave, grave danger. And that means we're all in grave, grave danger. And anybody who thinks that we're gonna have an economy without an ecosystem uh, has shit for brains in my opinion. Um, but, and is gonna have no, no place left. So um, think about your food choices because that's the way you directly connect with the ecosystem each and every day. And are you making choices that support an agriculture that's sequestering carbon? Because to me, a regenerative agriculture is likely the most cost-effective way we can both try to reduce the severity of climate change by moving more and more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and into the soil and create resilience which will mitigate against the flooding and the droughts that we're likely to see because as we increase soil organic matter, we increase the porosity of the soil to hold water and take it in during severe rainfall events reducing flooding and hold on to that water so that when the flooding stops and the drought starts, the moisture's there in the soil rather than having been rushed off into the rivers and off into the ocean. So um, to me, it's both a very hopeful and very important thing. And I didn't put them up initially, but I will, as we're doing the chat, pull up the information on uh, a little uh, video on uh, Netflix called Kiss the Earth and also uh, Farmers for Climate Solutions. And I'll put those, if I uh, can find them in a timely fashion into the chat. But thank you very much for your time. Uh, my wife uh, in meetings is always at the back going like this, time, time, shut up. You've gone on way long enough. So thank you for joining us this event and uh, I'll look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Tony. Um... And thank you, Roger, as well. Thank you both for your openness and your sharing of your stories and, and for the time and effort that you put in uh, for tonight. And I'd like to open it up to questions and comments for uh, Tony or Roger. Um, so please feel free to um, unmute yourself and speak or raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, but just to get us started, um, I wanted to ask a question myself and this is for either one of you. Um, but as you're both war resistors, I wanted to get an idea of what was most helpful or most useful to you during your time of when you were going through the actual process of resisting war and, and moving to Canada. What was, most, what was the most useful kind of support that you received? Um, and um, how might we be able to offer the same um, sort of support to others? Because one of the projects that CFSC does work on is um, helping an organization in Israel-Palestine that helps um, war resistors there. So um, how might you 
um, how might we support that or what was most useful for you? I, I would say probably really detailed information. You know, I mentioned in my little talk how amazing the Bloomington Quakers were. They set me up with, with the knowledge that made a difference. So detailed procedural stuff, make it simple, but make it detailed oh, really? enough, <laughs> I guess. And the other thing is, though, as I mentioned, those Quakers were in touch with the draft resistant uh, support groups here in Canada. So the, the up-to-date networking of the situation and make sure it's always up to date and a, a realistic reflection of reality. Well, for me, um, you know, I'd been giving out the information uh, from uh, American Friends Service Committee, Canadian Friends Service Committee, uh, Center for Conscientious Objectors, Central Committee for Conscientious Objectors. So I had all that information. So it, it, I, I, I used it in terms of knowing the process of how to apply um, for, for uh, immigrant status uh, when I did it. But I, I uh, also had a, a contact in London, Ontario, uh, in the uh, Quaker community there who I was able to stay with and that made a very big help. So um, being able to connect people with people who are willing to enable to support them, to give them a place to stay, give them uh, a place to work, um, uh, are certainly helpful to anyone who's gone through the trauma of, of leaving their home, leaving their country and um, putting their small self up against whatever war machine um, is existing in their country. I mean, one of, one of the things in North America and Canada, a great many of the early settlers on this continent, while they were terrible in their treatment of the indigenous community in many cases, uh, were choosing not to be cannon fodder in the European war meat grinder. So, um, Support. Great, thank you. Uh, Jen, I see your hand up. Do you have something? I do. I wanted to uh, both give a shout out to Tony's um, original email to CFSC around the Reconciliation Fund, but I also wanted to just share the example a little bit with other friends. Um, uh, because it is a bit, so Tony originally had reached out to me as he told the story when he felt compelled to do that, and he said, and he reached out and he said he wanted to give some funds uh, around reconciliation. And I knew that some of the large churches that ran residential schools had set up specifically reconciliation funds. And so I had sent him information on that. And he wrote back and he said, no, no, I, I, I'm looking for a Quaker one. And so um, uh, I, we thought long and hard about it at CFSC because partly because CFSC didn't run residential schools in Canada. Um, and I mean, although American friends were involved in boarding schools in the United States, um, but in, in Canada, that was not the case for uh, Canadian friends. And so our role in the reconciliation journey is a little different than our friends at uh, faith communities where they had played that role. And so I thought, and I thought, but how can we at CFSC, um, how can we make the decisions on how to spend that money? And so what CFSC came up with was that we would approach, we approached several of our indigenous partners, longtime partners that we had a long-term relationship with. And we said, are you willing to be an advisory committee? And so when we get applications to the reconciliation fund, you will give us guidance. And um, so that's what we did. So uh, it was Tony's initiative and prodding um, to have CFSC set up the reconciliation fund. And it's been, um, something that it's has grown and uh, but I guess the point of that is both to give a shout out to Tony but also to just say you know it's not some it's not a journey that CFSC was on to set up a fund like that and it was an individual friend uh, who contacted us and said hey you know I I want to 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 do this and I want you to help me to do this and so um, I would just urge all of you to, I mean, I don't want all of you to write to me tomorrow saying I have a project for you, but, um, but I would just say, remember, you know, we are your service committee. That is why we exist. And so um, uh, 
Uh, it is, we take very seriously when people contact us and say, no, there's something I want to do. Uh, can you help me to make this happen? Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, and thank you again, Tony, for that. We have a, um, a really nice reconciliation fund and we've already given out a couple of grants uh, this year for it um, and a bunch over the last couple of years. So it is, um, it's doing really well and it's supporting some really good indigenous led work. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to open up if anybody else has any questions or comments, please feel free to jump in. Hi, Roger and uh, Tony. Thanks so much for your really engaging talks. And I note that both of you highlighted the role of love in Quaker service. And is that by accident that you both highlight it? Or do you think there's something really there that um, is uh, unique about Quaker service and love together? Either one of you, <laughs> or both. Well, certainly for myself, I don't. I I have a hard time practicing non-judgmental and and non-angry um, reaction to um, you know what I hear in the news or what I see um, that seems dishonest and duplicitous and and greedy and all that but i do think if if we're going to connect with people and build something that those are not emotions that are very um helpful and uh so i think that that kindness and love and consideration are important um and that um one of the things that my father said to me um was, and I mean, he, he had served in the Second World War in the Navy. He came from a Roman Catholic background. He came to Quakers uh, after, um, though he'd had contact with Quakers in, in his youth and in his educational experience. But, um, you know, he said to me, war just sows the seeds for the next war. Um, and he felt very much that the First World War had sown the seeds of the Second World War. And uh, that, that it was a, a non-productive um, thing. So uh, I think that war is the, the, the big manifestation of all those negative um, hate, anger, greed, selfishness um, that we have to struggle with at all levels. Um, and so certainly that, that sense of love and empathy and caring for others um, and trying to figure out ways to, as Roger was talking about, um, communicate more effectively, deal with the underlying causes of male, uh, female violence in our society. All these, these things are, are important in building the foundation um, for the piece that was part of us saying no to the war itself. I, um, I'm thinking about the uh, spirit spirit-led action you know um it's it's fairly common for religious institutions to go off the the rails and and kind of get caught up something that starts to get non-functional but um i think quakers the have, have got it together pr pretty well the the way um uh, spirit-led uh care works with what we do in in the world and we don't we try not to lean too far one way or the other i i feel that it's real i i feel and that, that's why i'm sort of a quaker by convincement i've i've seen it in the two people that i talked about and i've seen it in the meet in our meeting that um there's this still small voice of of compare, uh, compassion 
and tenderness. And we're going to pay attention to that. We're not going to repress that. And this is love. And, and let's, let's see what love can accomplish. I want to say one more thing about Muriel. Muriel was a, was a committed pacifist. And the peace testimony was her testimony. And Muriel did not put an escape clause on it. So I think we should, all of us should see what sort of leadings we might have in, in terms of the peace testimony. So I decided earlier tonight, I'd like to declare myself a pacifist. So I'm gonna do it. I declare myself to be a pacifist. Thank you, Vince, for that question. Um, and thank you for your, your responses. And um, I've just got a, a question in the chat here about um, how, have, how have you seen a change between how people are responding to war resistors and to, to, um, to the concept of peace since when you were originally a war resistor and, um, to now? What's, what kind of changes and attitudes have you seen throughout the years? Well, of course, CFC did everything they could to support the Iraqi war resistors. And there was so much public and government oppression, you know. Um, I don't I don't know. I, I certainly worry about militarism and the kind of send up of, of the militaristic notions of, of things. Um, so there are organizations that are doing incredible work. There are two I want to mention, World Beyond War, and also, boy, the Vets for Peace in the US, they're both great, and they're really making the link between militarism and climate chaos, which isn't talked about enough. So check out both those organizations, what, what they're up to. Well, I, I'm also, I have a very difficult time with uh, Remembrance Day because it seems to me like, let's forget all the lessons of previous wars. Let's just get on the bandwagon and say how, you know, I don't want to remember our glorious dead. I want to remember our horribly sacrificed and wasted dead um, who are both in uniform and now with technological warfare, the 90% who never had wanted to do anything with the war, but it happened to be the collateral damage. Um, but I think, I think in some ways we approach it poorly because I think one of the things we should be saying is the choice to spend on the military is the choice not to spend on health and not to spend on education and not to spend on the environment. And the fact to spend on things which make each of these areas worse because it makes the health of the soldiers and the communities where war goes on much worse. And it makes the need for education and trying to deal with uh, um, you know, the uh, trauma symptoms and all that stuff at the, at, and re reintegrating people who've been taught to disregard the sanctity of life and to kill each other. You know, so don't, and in terms of the environment, I can't think of anything worse for the environment than a war zone. So, if we're concerned with creating something that is hopeful for the future, we can't be spending our money here. We've got to be spending our money there. We, we, you know, it, it is the, and, but, but if we just get caught up into, you know, geopolitics and who's right and who's wrong, we're not going to get there. But if we talk about, well, you know, you want to have a healthcare system that works, or do you want to have something that's even more strained by the, the injured coming back and the, you know, anyway, that, that's my thought. So um, yeah, I, 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 I guess um, when I still talk about my choices to people on the street, um, there's still support. Um, there's still a sense of, yeah, that was a good decision. Um, and uh, I had a very funny experience uh, to me. I was talking um, with somebody um, maybe 10 or 15 years after I was here in, in one of the farm organizations. I had no idea of his politics and I was telling him my story and I know where I came from, I was a coward. And he said, boy, you must have been really brave to do that. Uh, whoa. 
Yeah, but yeah, you're right. Standing up to the U.S. military uh, either takes a lot of stupidity or a lot of, a lot of nerve. Um, but we, we need to help people make the connections by what we're saying no to when we choose to try and seek military solutions to political problems. Or, and, and when we spend so much on the military that it then becomes the only tool in our toolbox. So it's the only hammer we have when it comes to dealing with a whole range of fasteners of how to knit the society together. We are just gonna hit it with the, hand, the war nail, war hammer on, the, on whatever nail screw or uh, rivet we're facing. Sheldon, did you want to say something? Uh, I have a question for both. What difference do you see between the conscientious subjector war resistor who becomes an immigrant and the refugees who are seeking asylum and also are immigrants? I, I don't see much difference. We're yeah. both displaced persons by the violence in our societies. Um, and they, they, in many ways, faced a much more difficult and much more direct experience than I did. Um, so in terms of figuring out how to deal with them with compassion, I think is important. Um, and mm -hmm. to, to recognize that if if we don't deal with the big underlying issues of how to take away those causes of war, how to deal with the displacement that climate crisis is going to um, create, uh, we're going to be facing a lot more of this sort of displacement and refugee situation. Yeah, and I, I would just add, uh, you might want to check out a couple more organizations, War Resisters International, which gives support to conscientious objectors who are in prison in various countries and trying to promote uh, conscientious objector status as a actual uh, government possibility in countries that don't have it. Uh, there's also an amazing website, refuser.org, which is supporting Israeli uh, refusers, these very courageous young men and women who will not go into the Israeli army and uh, oppress Palestine. Uh, these, are, these are the people today that are courageous and deserve full support, I think. Thank you for your question, Sheldon, and for your responses. Um, Roger, my, I actually have a, a question for you. Tony has told us a little bit about what the response was to his, um, when he sort of announced that he was um, becoming a conscientious objector. I'd be really curious to how that compares with your experience. Um, are you able to, are you comfortable with sharing more on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, a couple of things. First, um, my, my parents were, were supportive. So I was incredibly lucky in, in that regard. Um, I'll, I'll just tell a quick story about all that. The Bloomington Quakers had heard there's this idea that, you know, if you go to Canada and go to the U.S. Embassy and renounce your citizenship before the date that you're supposed to show up, before your induction date, you actually will not be susceptible to have broken a U.S. law because you're no longer a U.S. citizen. And this was before the Car Carter amnesty and those other amnesties. So I did it. Within three days of arriving in Toronto, I went to the U.S. Embassy or consulate and told, the, told them I, I want to uh, no longer be an American. And so he gets the papers out. Do you know what you're giving up? Yeah, I, I know exactly what I'm giving up. So I did that and sent it to my draft board and and they had no idea what this was and thought I was AWOL. So my beloved father got a lawyer onto it and said, look, you can't draft somebody who's, who's not a citizen of your country. But I was stateless here for, for five years. So I certainly had to be careful. But after five years, I became a Canadian citizen and went, went back. Um, 
I, I should just say that I, I, I was in the 1% of people having an incredibly easy ride of it. I mean, I was privileged, right? I mean, I spoke the language, I was educated, I had some financial backing. I mean, holy smoke, I, you know, and I'm very aware of this, that uh, this 99% did not experience what, what I did in terms of getting out of, a, of being forced to, to fight in a war. Well, I should maybe say a little bit more about my parents' reaction. They were, they were pretty perplexed as to why I didn't feel comfortable being a conscientious objector. And uh, they, they did support me, but they, and I think they decided that my decision to go to Canada rather than prison was probably a good one, though that was also hard on them. Um, so I had family support as well. And I like, like Roger was certainly um, very privileged and that I was able to, to get a, a job quickly. And I knew when I came to Canada that I was coming to Canada. Um, that, that I, this was where I was planning to make my home. So I had that clarity. I, I wasn't sort of torn um, in, in the way uh, some people were. And I actually had a young man who came and stayed with me for a while and then went back to the States um, because he uh, uh, just couldn't face being away from his, his home and his family in that way. Um, so um, in that sense, like, yeah was was pretty lucky in terms of of that and um and the and the kind of support and certainly the community i mean i didn't make a big thing out of being a, a war resistor when i was working as a hired hand but people uh certainly knew and then when i i went actually went back to grade 13 in the godrich high school uh, because to get into university in canada i had to have my grade 13 and and uh, um, people knew that I was a war resistor there. And I do remember in, sitting in a biology class at one point thinking, these 18 year olds are joking around, having a, having a good time. Uh, the guys are thinking about girls and they're uh, just, just young adults. They aren't having to decide whether they're gonna go pour napalm on somebody. They don't have to think about you know, what's their position gonna be in terms of the, the war, uh, which just made me appreciate what a, what a difference experience being in high school in the States had been versus high school in, in Canada. Thank you. I wanna give it a few minutes because I feel like I've been asking all the questions. So I wanna leave a little bit of time to let other folks uh, jump in here if you have anything. So please feel free to unmute yourself or, um, oh, Carl, you have your hand raised. Do you wanna? Can I speak? Uh, yes. Uh, what Tony said really resonates with me because when I came to Canada in 1968, um, it was a different experience, different location. I came to Toronto and uh, my first time was uh, as a visitor smuggling up money for Canadian Friends Service Committee that had been donated by members of our meeting. And uh, L Lyndon Baines Johnson had forbidden any mail to be delivered to Canadian Friends Service Committee or to Kathleen uh, Hertzberg or to Ursula Franklin because of the war, uh, the, the aid to the Red Cross societies of North Vietnam, the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam. So I smuggled up some money and uh, I wound up uh, staying at friend's house and meeting the giants that walk the earth. Um, uh, Mary Thompson, Ursula Franklin, um, the, 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 the whole group of people, the, the Abbots and the Newberries <clears throat> and uh, Joe Vellicott. And it was just like a different world. And my age mates, here in Canada, we're saying, well, now, who do we think will be the top nation to come? Britain is done. And um, the United States is, is definitely on the way out. And this, this mode of thinking that the United States would not forever be on top of the world was just so different from what it was in the United States. And it was just such a liberation to be here. Um, 
The Germans have a uh, saying, Stadt Luft macht frei, city air makes you free. And uh, Toronto's air was like that for me. Thank you so much for sharing, Carl. Mm. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, Dick, Dick, uh, would you, do you want to say anything now or would you prefer not to, Dick Cotterell? <clears throat> I'm just, I'm just remembering <clears throat> how young we were, you know, <clears throat> when we turned 18, we, we had to go to war and you know, I, I was 19 when, <clears throat> when I went into the Marine Corps and I was 22 when they, when the Marines wanted me to go to Vietnam and I, and I came to Canada instead. And uh, I knew nothing about Canada. I knew nobody in Canada. And it was the it was the Quakers in Halifax who took me in and you know helped me to emigrate and gave you know fed me and gave me a bed and gave me a place to live for the first few months and and uh, became my family and, and are still my family today. Thank you for sharing, Dick. Um, and I recognize that there are, are likely a few other war resistors um, joining us tonight. Um, and so please do feel free to speak up and share. Um, I did, um, I know Dick a little bit better than most because he was a member of CFSC. And um, I didn't want to put him on the spot, but I'm, I'm very happy that you, you shared uh, tonight, Dick. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for, for sharing Carl as well. Um, we're getting sort of close to the end of our time together and I had a little bit that I wanted to share still so I'm going to um, jump in here but I wanted to give Roger and Tony the chance to say anything else that that might be on your mind uh, before I, I close us off here. Go ahead Roger. Thank you friends for for listening uh, to us and uh, we're all, this is a fine organization and I think we all feel blessed to be in community with, with one another. I think what I'd say in, in closing is that what my experience has, has brought home to me is the value of following leadings, even if they're difficult making and the, the choice that seems right and ethical at the time, because certainly the choice to refuse to cooperate with the draft and then the choice to come to Canada were hugely formative to the path that I ended up on. And as I look back on, I have some regrets. I have some things I didn't do as well as I could have or didn't maybe behave as well as I could. But overall, um, I, I feel very content isn't the right word, but in terms of feeling free in my spirit and um, a sense that I've done what I could as best as I could um, uh, is pretty strong. And, and again, having as we do the organizations that we can support where we can share our strength, share our values and work together for the kind of world that would be without war, that would take away the causes of violence and conflict, and that would build the blessed community um, and the blessed ecosystem in which that community might thrive, um, are, are what we can build together in ways that we certainly couldn't do it by ourselves. So um, thank you all for being here tonight. And may you uh, carry on with the work in the world that need, needs so desperately. Take care. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Roger. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being here with us tonight. And we've had 
now 11 months of some really fantastic uh, speakers in our series. Um, and thank you so many of whom are on the call. So thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, and there's been such uh, a depth of expression about different ways that folks have supported CFSC. Um, and thank you so much for all of the different types of support. Um, I wanted to let folks know that one very generous donor wanted to do something special tonight. Um, to honor the 90th anniversary of CFSC. So this donor has agreed to match any donation up to $500 um, for the next 24 hours. So if folks are interested in donating to CFSC, I'm gonna post a link in the chat. Um, and this, which means that if we get up to $500 worth of donations tonight, this, uh, this donor will double it um, very generously. So um, if you're led, please do make a donation to CFSC in honor of our 90th anniversary. Um, and we would greatly appreciate that. And it's a really fantastic way um, of supporting the work that has been discussed over the last 11 months. Um, as Kara, I mentioned at, oh, yes. Kara, is that $500 total or $500 from each donor? It's just $500 total. So um, please, please donate what you're able um, or you're led to, um, but they are willing to add it $500 that if we reach the $500 goal. Um, so please, uh, please do. Um, I hope that makes it clearer, or maybe I've just made it more confusing. Um, please let me know. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, Roger and Tony were our last speakers in the series as our December event is going to look a little bit different. Um, we really wanted, um, recognizing that people have contributed in very different ways, we wanted to give a time to share space. So on December 9th, we're moving it up to the 9th because the last Thursday of December is right around New Year's that we realized that's a really busy time for folks. Um, so two weeks from today, December 9th, we're going to be holding our Get to Know the Friend Holiday Social. Um, and we hope that you will come and join us with stories of your own that you want to share. Um, and, and just share the space together. And I'm trying to arrange something a little bit special, but I'm going to keep it as a surprise because I haven't confirmed it yet. So um, please join us for hopefully a really great surprise. Um, and I also wanted to take a moment to recognize that there are so many people that have contributed to CFSC over the last 90 years, and we could have done so many more of these events um, and share tonight with each and every one of those people, but just due to time and capacity, we weren't able to. So um, I really wanna send a shout out to those friends who have been so involved in CFSC and done so much for us, um, but we weren't able to, to fit into this series. Um, but we, we appreciate you all so very much. Um, and I wanted to make sure that that was said. Um, with that in mind, um, I'm gonna wish everyone um, a really great night.